Dan. Brandon. As you know, I am one of the foremost minds when it comes to one moral of philosophy. the finest moral philosophers yes. of our age. I am, to moral philosophy, what a heap of dung is to a field. You have to spread it around and help yeah. little things to grow. Yes, yes. So I have, I have a Brandon's trolley problem for you that is the least trolley problem ask of the trolley problems okay. I've presented so far. Okay. You are going to be struck down with some terrible pandemic level disease. Okay. Um, and purely hypothetically. Purely hypothetically. You, this is not something that happened to me last not week. Not something that happened. Are heading toward Hawaii. Okay. That would be the worst place. That would be the worst. Would it? This is the question. Okay. Would you rather have a wonderful environment? Let's say that being sick with this disease is like a one out of 10. Okay. And your normal life is like a six out of 10. But being in Hawaii raises you by five points. To an 11 out of 10. Would you rather be? Now, let's say that, you, you know, like... I would argue that for me, my enjoyment of Hawaii kind of, you know, of anything caps at like a 10, right? Mm-hmm. And so I would be at a 10 out of 10 in Hawaii. It's one of my favorite places. W- sick raises me from a one to like a five or six, right? Okay. In Hawaii. Would you rather be sick in a place that makes you feel better to counteract the sickness? Or would you rather be as miserable as you can for a short period of time and then allowed to enjoy the the wonder that is uh, Hawaii unfettered? Okay. Mm -hmm. So is this asking not where would you rather be quarantined, but like... Do you want to have all of your illness packed into two days? No, no, no. It's more. Of, it's more the would, where would you rather be? Where quarantined? would you rather be quarantined? Yeah. Would you rather be quarantined in a beautiful place? Um, okay. Or, or would you? Will being in that beautiful place just make you think of all the things you're missing out on? So, um, this happened to you. This is why. From experience, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, my wife and I flew mm-hmm. down to Oahu last week. Um, two weeks ago, almost. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I was there the very first day. So we got there on a Sunday. Mm-hmm. Monday, I started to feel really bad. And then Tuesday morning, tested positive for COVID. Not sure where that came from or how long the incubation mm-hmm. period is. Did I get it on the plane? Did I get it earlier and I had it on the plane? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I spent five days of most of my trip. To Hawaii, uh, completely quarantined. In fact, we had to extend and get different flights so that we could quarantine and be safely five days out, which is what the CDC suggests, Mm -hmm. before we flew home. Um, So on the one hand, Mm -hmm. it was a great place to be sick Mm -hmm. because uh, we could open the window and have this incredible, wonderful, fresh sea air. Mm -hmm. Uh, I could door dash really fresh poke bowls and ramen and stuff that I could not get the same level of quality here in Utah. Wow, you're one of the first people who has spoken of the food in a positive light in Hawaii that I know. There's a lot of problems with Hawaii. If you order the right things, it's fantastic. Um, But I travel in order to eat. Like That's the point of going somewhere for me. Mm -hmm. So I knew the right places to go. Right. Um, Yeah. And talked to the right people and made sure Mm -hmm. that I was hitting all the good places. Um, yeah. On the other hand, um, the person that was going to be taking care of my kids while I was gone got sick and had to back out. The second person got sick and had to back out. The third person said, oh no, there's too much sickness. I, and, and it's my mother-in-law. She's immunocompromised. She just, she's, just getting over mm-hmm. cancer treatments. So she had to stay away. And so my children were essentially just feral for three or four days. And that made the whole thing worse. That wasn't part of your... Not part of my trolley problem. Your trolley but problem. You're adding some real world... You yeah. Know, um, it, it kind of, in some ways, ruins a trolley problem to add a real world <laughs> experience to it. Um, but... Uh, I uh, we can't we can't separate yeah. you know we're, we are like uh, we're we're observing the the quantum the quanta mm-hmm. and they are yes. 
um, they are being influenced by us. And so what what I can say in hindsight is mm -hmm. that a it was the worst vacation I've been on. Okay. Uh, but B, I'm really glad it happened because I love telling stories. Ooh. And so being able to say, yes, I got to go to Hawaii for a week with my wife and spent the entire time quarantined in a hotel room. Um, that's just a good story. I'll drink for free on that one for quite a while. So, transition. Lord of the Rings. Uh, we need like a smoke bomb we yeah, can yeah, throw yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Da -da 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 -da. Like in, uh, was it Batman that did that? Um, yeah. So, uh, Lord of the Rings. Lord we're, of the Rings. We're back on Lord of the Rings. Let's talk about Lord of the Rings. Uh, let's talk about mm -hmm. uh, what I have mentioned in two previous episodes as being one of my favorite parts, and we have never mm -hmm. dug deep into it. Okay. Theo's character arc. Okay, yeah. Theo as a character is, Handled by the end of the well. season, the most interesting part of the show for me. Um Everybody else felt like, and we've joked about how, mm -hmm. you know, we're following not Frodo and not Sam as they mm -hmm. deal with not Gandalf. Yep. Over here on the other side, we have not Legolas, who is helping fight, you know, the, all mm -hmm. of the other things. Yep. Theo doesn't fit into any of those boxes. He doesn't. He is the one who is most himself. He we, is a unique and new character. We thought he was going to be not Gollum. Yeah. Right? The, well, and that's oh, the thing. We thought yeah. for a while he's going to be maybe mm -hmm. not Gollum, or yeah. maybe he's going to turn into a ring wraith. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's going to turn into the king under the mountain, whatever yeah. the, the ghost king is called. Mm -hmm. And he just kept going back and forth. Which is really interesting. And he was defying stereotype mm -hmm. in a show that is basically founded on stereotype. And they used him really well to also establish the old man who eventually betrays them mm -hmm. and things like that and when the old man betrays them there is that moment and theo makes a choice right like yeah. he makes a legitimate choice and he stays um good on you theo we see him in the beginning mm -hmm. uh hates the elves mm -hmm. uh you know mad at his mom because she's yep. got the hots for one mm -hmm. um and we're thinking you know is he gonna be like part of this anti-elf rebellion and mm -hmm. then no his story goes somewhere else and he finds this evil sword and now he's we know he's gonna turn into an evil corrupt guy no his story goes somewhere else and he gives the sword away voluntarily yep. every step of the process he did something interesting and unexpected which i loved this is why i want him to be the king um Un, of the ghosts. Mm -hmm. I think the king under the mountain is the king dwarf. under the mountain is the dwarf. Yeah, yeah that's uh, I can't remember foreign. what he's called. Uh, but uh, uh, I w the reason being, uh, I really want to understand like the betrayal that that king made. Mm -hmm. uh, I want it to be interesting and complex and uh, and made for perhaps a good reason because you know we know Isildur isn't the best guy around. He yeah. keeps the ring. Mm -hmm. And so his cursing of them, which I, I think I'm getting the lore right. I, I I would have Adam look it up if he were here, but Adam has ditched us today. We'll have Octavia look it up. <laughs> Is the, the ghost king, does he curse by Isildur? Can you look that up so that the Tolkien fans... Or was he just cursed have... by yeah. the inherent magic of breaking an oath? Yeah, yeah. And was it Isildur he betrayed? Um, and... Um, or am I just, you know, remembering, am I putting, conflating things yeah. in my head? But if it is what I'm thinking that he, you know, because he, he has to be released by a king of Gondor. So it's like a king related to the Gondor line and Aragorn's mm -hmm. like of the Numenorians, And so, yeah, Gondor um, doesn't even exist yet. Yeah. And so how that all works out, but, you but, know, they're compressing time so yeah. much that Gondor could show up out of nowhere. And I know that they... There, there are things internally at Amazon that said that they said they want to be in continuity as much as possible with the movies. Uh, and so part of the mm -hmm. reason why you know you're getting greatest hits is they want to be related to the movies. And so yeah. this is why I really that's a more interesting arc for Theo than becoming a ring wraith. I agree. Um, uh, so. because it gives him the chance yeah. to be a good guy and then make a bad decision instead yeah. of just jumping wholesale into evil or a complex decision right yeah um there might be really good reasons that he breaks that oath i don't that's, know you'll still there's a yeah. jerk <laughs> let's point out though that you could have a really complex arc with becoming a ring right too you absolutely here's could. a ring it'll help you protect the people you love it corrupts you slowly over time and then you're a shadow of your former self mm -hmm. um that could work just fine yeah. for theo as well it could that is true mm-hmm 
yeah. So anyway, I just really dug Theo. I thought that he was great. Okay. Um, now, do you want to hear about the the dumbest character in the show? Yes. Who is the dumbest character in the show? Ooh, Hellaborn. <laughs> Gelliborn is so dumb. Uh, well, or uh, let, let me guess. Let me guess what you're gonna what you're gonna say. Okay, Kelleborn, uh, the great dwarven smith. No, that's Celebrimbor. That's Celebrimbor. Kelebrimbor. Oh, the elven smith. I think he's the dumbest. He's pretty bad. Uh, uh, but no, Kelleborn is, is who is Kelleborn? Galadriel's husband. Husband. Oh, okay. Who you know? That's what everyone started screaming yeah. about from the very first mm-hmm. episode. Is during this period of history. Galadriel not only is married, but has a child who's like a thousand years old. Yes. Um, How can he be the dumbest? He's not Because in the show. he shows up in one conversation in like mm-hmm. episode seven where she says, oh, by the way, everybody, I'm I totally was... married to a guy and mm-hmm. he's really hot. You don't know him. He's in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and then gives the weirdest backstory <laughs> Of like, I met him at a party, and he was kind of weird, and we fell in love, and then I've never seen him ever since. And like, it's, oh, it's the weirdest, dumbest character introduction I've ever seen. That is pretty dumb. Uh, I think that it was at least a, here, Tolkien fans, we'll throw you a bone. Uh, He's going to show back up later on, uh, and it'll be interesting and complicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, Did you find that, Octavia? Yeah, so Isildur... Cursed, cursed the king of the dead. Isildur, okay. Cursed Isildur, the king him. of the dead. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so you know, I if Kelleb- Kelleborn does yes. show up, he, I want him to show up as like this big, like redneck guy, mm-hmm. like a hefty kind of overweight elf mm-hmm. who's a total deadbeat, and he's like, that's why he hasn't been present. <laughs> he's, he's fat Thor. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I don't want him to turn in is. Into and I had a, a premonition. I'm like, I don't think they're dumb enough to do that. Mm-hmm. The the Uruk. Mm-hmm. The Uruk would be Celeborn. They're not dumb enough to do that, right? No. That they've taken him. He's been corrupted uh, for hundreds of years, and we have to redeem him. And it turns out now he could also be the brother, <laughs> right? They, 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 they aren't oh. going to do either of those, are they? Right? I don't think that they are. Um, um, I give them I, big props because not. one of the one of the interesting things yes. about uh, Middle Earth to me is that mm-hmm. uh, Morgoth, Melkor, whoever yes. the original evil Satan guy, yeah, he cannot create; he can only corrupt. Yes, and so he didn't create orcs; he just corrupted elves. And to yeah. see. Adar there, the Uruk, mm-hmm. who's like mid-corruption. Yeah. I thought that was fun. I think that is cool, too. Yeah. Uh, let's just hope that he's not secretly somebody else. If he is, turns, if he out, turns out to, to be secretly be her oh brother. Oh, my gosh. He's I like mean, Baron from Baron and Luthien. He's like, I actually, this isn't even a real hand. They, um, I mean, they're leaning so much into the brother. Would the story be better? Like, when they, she brings up her husband, it got an eye roll for me also. The main reason being... Losing your husband seems like it would be as traumatic as losing your brother, right? Depending on yes, your relationship. I mean, yes. Um, and so to have him mentioned, they took my brother, dot, dot, dot. Oh, and my husband as well, that for six episodes I haven't mentioned that the orcs yeah. killed my husband. I forgot to tell you that Celeborn is totally still around. Well, no, the, she um, thinks he's dead, right? She, she thinks, thinks he's dead, dead mm-hmm. and all of the, I but don't know. But he has the same then story as her brother, doesn't it? Isn't it? He rode off to battle, well, she never saw him they, again. They were trying so hard to turn Finrod into like a major thing, and it's because they used him as part of the weird Sauron reveal at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Who's Finrod? The brother. Oh, the brother. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Finrod or Finarfin. It's one of the two, and I know that I, mm. I, I don't know which one. All right. My favorite thing is going to be so <laughs> controversial. <laughs> okay. I l- love Halbrand, okay. and I love him having a, a potential relationship with Gladriel. Let okay. me explain myself. Okay. All right. So what I love about Halbrand. Okay, we're getting Snickers from the peanut gallery <laughs> already. Um, and this is this is so Middle Earth 90210, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but um, 
I like the idea of humanizing Sauron. Yeah. I've, I've said that before. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is a really interesting thing. And beyond that, I think it is a, if they go this route, a good choice to have him not having planned all of this, right? It's too Dr. Evil for him to be like, hmm, I will find an elf on the ocean. She will take me here. I will do this. And then they will take me here. And then I'll do this. And then I'll go here and do this. Instead, if it is Sauron being like, you know, maybe I don't want to rule the world. That was pretty awful, all of those wars. Maybe I just want to make stuff. And I'm now on this island where I can make a new life. Maybe I just won't go back. Or maybe I'll just spend 100 years among these mortals here. Mm -hmm. And I'll just make stuff. And if that's a legit conflict for him. And then she's like, no, you got to be king. He's like, do you not understand? <laughs> do not crown me king of the Southlands. Bad idea. Yeah. And then he has to think about it. And he goes back for the thing and says, all right, I guess destiny's pulling me this way. And then, you know, he's there and mm -hmm. he's like, well, maybe I'll just be a king of men in this realm. And then it's like, oh, you found a new metal and I'm here all of a sudden and I can bind all the elves and the dwarves and the men to me. Well, all right. He's like, fine. Fine. Uh, like, I like that. It doesn't that. take much to corrupt Sauron. Yes, it doesn't take much. But it is a little yeah, bit of corruption. But it is a little bit. Yeah. He, you know, I think that is really cool. Uh, and I, if, if there are, you could therefore not have a romance between him and anyone else, mm -hmm. but you can imply a little bit of one with Galadriel. Maybe not a romance. That's probably going too far. They probably took one step too far, but a friendship and things like that. She mm -hmm. is one of the few equals to him that is in the show. Yeah. The possible, in fact, she's the only possible equal to him that's been presented in the show so far. Um... And so it is an interesting dynamic. They play it really well. I will say, though, the dumbest character is not missing husband. It is Celebrimborn. Celebrimborn. Celebrimborn, the brilliant elven smith who has created marvels and everything, is mm -hmm. there and then is like, well, we can't do anything with this. And Joe Nobody says, have you tried an alloy? Yes. <laughs> I... Oh, the instant he walks into mm -hmm. the workshop, mm -hmm. before he even says anything, yes. I turn to my wife and I'm like, oh my gosh, he's Sauron. She's like, how, how can you tell? Because it is so painfully obvious at this point. Uh, you were resisting it? Oh, I was trying so hard yeah. to- like, I was there on episode three. I wanted him to three. be something else. And then- He's a good Sauron. He was a good Sauron mm -hmm. until the final episode when it when they lost all capacity for subtlety. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about how if stupid this is. They had kept it going. Yes. Like into season two. Yes. And like slow rolled it a bit, mm -hmm. and he just like wants to apprentice with Celebrimbor yeah. mm -hmm. and just turns out to be really good at his job, and then several episodes later, he starts, he keeps, you know. He makes very, a breakthrough, and he's yeah. like, hey, if we put these special runes on, it does the or thing. Or he even frames it as an accident. He's like, I'm just an idiot human, yes. but I accidentally put peanut butter in the chocolate, mm -hmm. and now look what we have. It could have been really good, right? Oh, it could have been great. And instead, they're just like, oh, we gotta flip the evil switch on this guy. It's not even that. I'm okay with flipping the evil switch on him. He's Sauron, right? Yeah. It doesn't take a lot to corrupt him. I am, I am have a big problem with Celebrimborn needing to be told, maybe you should alloy it. Yeah. Being need to, needed to told, maybe we should just mix the metals without pounding on them. Like, you try that, right? Mm hmm Having, <laughs> having him come out as Sauron before they forged the rings? Yes. And having them still what forge the rings is just. <laughs> See, I think, I think, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure because mm -hmm. it didn't make any sense. I think what they were trying to say is that the one ring had already been forged and then he took off with it. Oh, I don't think he, I don't think they were doing that at all. I think you think did. so. Okay. Yeah. It, and, and I, I hope you're right mm. because it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. But yeah, him just. I don't know. I, I can't it think of the any one other reason for him to out himself yeah. without 
The One Ring has yeah. to be forged in Morador, right? Like that's the whole thing. It yeah, was forged at true. Mount it Doom has and has to be, to be returned Doom, there huh? to be destroyed. Oh, well, like, then he has to go and forge it there. He has to go and forge it. Well, See, then why did he just I say? I have no idea. Uh, and oh. this like gets his into, plan was working so well, yeah. mm -hmm. and then he gets up to the greatest smith in history, yes. mm -hmm. and he's like, "I'm just a poor I'm just country a lawyer." Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I think I know how to solve this problem. And mm -hmm. then, like, did what did he gain? What did he learn? I, yeah, I, nothing. nothing. No, she confronts him. Now, this is this whole thing was stupid because Galadriel has through the whole thing been like, this is a useful pawn. He might be the king. He might not be. I'm mm -hmm. going to use him as the king because we need to unite around people. Mm -hmm. And then she goes and she she's like she finds some scroll that's like he might be the king. All right, I'm going to use that. Then later on, she finds out he's not the king. Big whoop, right? Like number one, why is she why is she researching it all of a sudden? What made her suspicious? Nothing. He's acting less suspicious than yeah. he ever has. Um, well, it's like she has the script, and so she's read the script, and she's like, oh, I need to be suspicious <laughs> now. And then she finds out he's not king, and then his well, response just needs to be, yeah, I'm just yeah, a guy. I told you I wasn't I told the you king, I'm not a king. Lady? I'm trying to live up to it. Right? You say that. Yeah. And then she's like, you know what? Yeah, you are trying to live up to it. I appreciate that. Well, We're good buddies. I wish that... <laughs> Like, I want to be able to actually see the records she found. Because yeah. she found something that convinced her. Yes. It just says there's no more king. Like, well, none of these kings had any bastard children. What she found eventually was there hasn't been a king for hundreds of years. Yes. So what did she find first that convinced her he was the king? Yeah. That could possibly go against the weight of hundreds of years of kinglessness. Hundreds of years of kinglessness that she would have been alive for, right? Yeah. Uh, so I guess hundreds of years doesn't mean a lot to doesn't her. Doesn't mean a lot to her, but, but at the same time... That's how many generations of human? Yeah, well, and beyond that, like, she would know, wouldn't she, that, like, you know, that there's no leader in yeah. the... Anyway, I don't know. I, I thought that whole sequence was so dumb. Like, the entire thing. if they would have been like, if you, you have to forge some of the rings, you have them forge the rings, and then you cut to Halbrand... And he sketched out the one ring on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And that's your ending. He doesn't have to reveal himself. He doesn't have to run. He doesn't yeah. have to do anything. You're just like, you know, uh, you, you do the whole Gandalf thing where they're like, you know, you aren't in there. And then he says something like, what was that other name they mentioned? That means something. Sauron. And then you cut straight to Halbrand. And it's the, at the end where they've got their things. And he has sketched out the one ring. And he looks up at the camera. And there's like red firelight reflecting in his eyes. And you're like, oh. Oh, he's out. Oh my goodness. He's, but he's still among them. But nobody it's, knows yet. Yeah. And that's cool for season two. He nobody mm -hmm. knows yet. He's among them. He's playing the you know, he's yeah. the the he's the liar and the the deceiver. Uh and he gets to play all those games and they get to have more relationship time with him and all these people, which is the most interesting part about the show. Mm hmm Well, and that is a, an important point to bring up because mm -hmm. so much of the drama of season one hinges around mm -hmm. people not knowing the other person's motives, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Every single plot line, that's the driving force. Can I trust you or not? Mm -hmm. And at the end of season one, everyone's pretty much staked out their moral territory, yes. right? Like mm -hmm. they're going to have to either introduce new characters that we yes. can be uncertain of or they're going to have to completely change the tone of the show because mm -hmm. we now know exactly who the bad guys are and who the good guys are with no ambiguity left. Yep. Uh, we do have some Theo and stuff. But yeah, wouldn't how awesome would it have been if Sauron spends season two gathering armies to him, including Gladriel and the elves, to march and conquer Mordor from mm. the orc guy to put himself in charge so he can finally forge his one ring because he needs to get to Mount Doom to do it. He tries it other places like no fire's hot enough. Oh, wait. Awesome. Uh, like, yeah. Like, it seems really obvious, some of these narrative choices. <laughs> and like, this one reeks of, having done a little bit of stuff in Hollywood, this one reeks of someone, like mm -hmm. the, the screenwriters having this awesome, subtle screenplay and someone up above saying, well, no, he has to do Sauron stuff. Uh, make yeah. him do Sauron stuff. 
uh, where do we have him do Sauron stuff? Oh, where he's talking to Galadriel. Have him say, yep, I'm Iron Man. <laughs> it worked for the Marvels. Well, and yes, the, the you can see some executive in a meeting mm -hmm. being like, okay, I've read all these scripts. Mm -hmm. Our show's called Rings of Power. There's no rings. Yes. And they're like, no, we're building towards that. Like, it's mm -hmm. all about subtlety and it's all about, no, you got to have rings in, in your Rings, rings of, of Power, Power series. Yeah. Come on, guys. I think they were pushing toward that one. I think they that that was an early mandate. This one feels like meddling. The same thing with yeah. the the Harfoots don't have enough drama. Add some drama. Well, what kind of drama? Have them have them threaten to leave them behind. This was your idea, I think, that you thought this is what happened, right? And then they're like, "Sir, our whole thing for the Harfoots is that they're big-hearted. They sing a song about no one walking alone." Like, "Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh make them leave them behind." Yeah. Um, uh, while singing the song, yeah, that, that'll that'll be nice. Ha, put uh, put in a scene where they talk about all tension. all the people that they've murdered, um, or manslaughtered, uh, <laughs> so that we know they've done it a ton in the past, and that'll make it okay. Yeah. Oh, and you know, and given what I assume was an executive mandate to mm -hmm. include Rings of Power yes. in season one of Rings of Power. Mm -hmm. How many fake outs were there in that final episode yeah. where they're like, I'm building a crown. No, something smaller, oh, but still was... round. But I'm not going to say it out loud. So dumb. So many times. <laughs> that one was dumb. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, and running for dumbest character is also the king of the elves who just Gil -Galad. at every decision point makes the dumbest choice he could make. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Elrond, go to the dwarves, and we're dying, and the dwarves are good, upright people. Maybe they'll help us. No, no, we're not going to tell Elrond that. We'll let him lie, or, and then, ah, and then, yeah. we found a way to save us. Nope, we got to go. Wow, wait, wait, you realize that if we had worked with the dwarves like you wanted, mm -hmm. we would have to spend months and months and months mining mithril, right? We would, like, that was part of the plan. Yeah. Now you need to leave now when we have a solution that will probably only take a few weeks. Nope, gotta go. Nope, this is dumb, and we're leaving. Yep. And I am the magical drama manufacturer machine. Yep. Um, but let's talk about the dwarves, because we haven't okay. talked about the okay. dwarves. Because I said last episode, my two favorite things were tied. One is Halbrand as Sauron. Yes. Um, the second is Elrond and Durin, you can do no wrong. Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know that meme where we're like, I'm mad at all of you, not you. Yeah. And all of you, Elrond and Durin, you have a complicated, messed up relationship with all the people around you in the right way. And I love you. <laughs> I love you. I love. Uh, I love the dwarf woman. Disa. I love Disa. Disa is so good. Uh, I love everything that happens. I love that she's got this ambition going. That is, they're resisting the. She gets yeah. a little Lady Macbethy yeah. right uh -huh. at the end. Yeah, which was kind of fun. Like all of this has some nuance. It has interesting characters. I still like them despite their mm -hmm. flaws. Uh, and, and you know, it's real yeah. cool. So uh, even Durin's father, yes, who mm -hmm. is kind of a jerk, he was a good character. Yeah, he's not a drama manufacturer. He has a perspective mm -hmm. that is reasonable that I understand. He's worried about mining this magical metal. Yeah. You can read the subtext that he says this could destroy us. We should cover it up because I see the glint in my son's eyes when he talks about mining this stuff. Mm -hmm. We don't go there, and it, you yeah. know, like he's. It's all there. There's yeah. a, a moment in one of the early episodes mm -hmm. where Durin thinks his dad is going to chew him out. Yes, and then Durin's like, "No, you're my son. You're mm -hmm. going to be the next king. Yeah, you need to be making these kinds of decisions. I'm mm -hmm. proud of you." And it felt mm -hmm. in character. And then there's a moment later on where Durin's like, "I'm the king. I need to be making these kind of decisions." And his dad says, "No, this is the bad one." You've done something wrong, and it felt in character. It did. Yep. He was consistent, even though he sometimes was opposed to Durin and sometimes yes. in supporting him. Yep. Uh, that whole plot line was great. No complaints. Um, I I did. I I was kind of annoyed at the cheeky elves are always superheroes thing at the end, where he's like, 
you failed that hammer contest on purpose. And Elrond's like, I'm a little rascal. See, I think I'm choosing my headcanon is he didn't fail it on purpose, but he has to maintain He's this just... air of how cool elves are. And it's like, it's like, so he in totally their... lied to him. Yeah. And he totally lied to him. Um, and during getting the table <laughs> was so great. Oh, yeah. That uh-huh. whole thing and him making it up. Yeah. Uh, the moment where the fallen leaf mm-hmm. regenerates. Yes. Uh, was wonderful. Yep. So many things about mm-hmm. all the dwarf stuff yep. worked so well for me. Yep. Um, I do continue to complain that they're trying to be the origin story of everything. We mm-hmm. don't need Mithril and Balrogs and all of this stuff all at the same time. But given that that's what they decided to do, they did it really well. Yes, they did. Um, I don't know. Waking the Balrog at the end was a little dumb. It was. Uh, because it was That's only it. there for, for trailer stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, having the actual leaf float down and fall next to the Balrog. Um, I mean, it there, was it was a super huge stretch. And then the reason that I don't like it is because we're like, oh, the Balrog's awake. Oh, no, it's going to be two years. The yeah. Balrog has to not be awake. We're mm-hmm. going to come back, and it's going to take many episodes. I'll be proven yeah. wrong if the Balrog attacks in episode one, which would be pretty awesome. But I don't think they're going to do that. They're going to have to remind people the Balrog's there because they'll know it's been two years. They'll have to have a little bit of a slow burn, and they'll have to use it as the major climax in the middle of the series mm-hmm. uh, of season two. And well, so... and it just feels like a waste, mm-hmm. right? Like, first of all, again, Rings of Power, you don't have to do absolutely everything in season one. Yes. Uh, how much more interesting would it be for Durin to finally win the argument convince all the dwarves yeah we're gonna mine and they're like that's way too deep and he's like we can totally pull this off and then as a society which is what's always implied by moria they dig too deep they get too greedy and it's not just one guy and his buddy cracking open a giant pit yeah it's the whole society moving down and and going too far yeah yeah and Um, now they can't do any of that because the belrog's already awake and accessible yes so yeah yep this is this is sounds like studio mandate to me Mm -hmm. we we have to have a balrog right it's like what are we gonna do with lord of the rings if not a balrog so we gotta put him in yeah yeah oh well bunch of frivolous nonsense so um okay were there any other Let's, predictions um uh well let's let's talk about galadriel okay um because she we haven't I talked think about has, numenor either no and we haven't mm-hmm. talked about that uh mm-hmm. galadriel got the preponderance of critique i think from most people who watch the show yes uh she is very driven mm-hmm. uh she is single-minded to a fault yep I actually liked that about her. I like it better end of the s- series than I did at the beginning. Yes. Because it feels very deliberate now. Mm-hmm. Now I know they're going, Galadriel's going too far. The text knows it, so I can relax mm-hmm. about if the text is trying to say, no, this is the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, because in the, in the early bit, mm-hmm. you, you really didn't have that lantern on it. Yes. And so you weren't sure if... Mm-hmm. You know, does does the show actually think she's making good decisions for good reasons? Or are they do they see the same thing I yep. see? And you're right. By the end, we can see, mm-hmm. yes, uh, she is right about some stuff. She's also an absolute zealot mm-hmm. who is going to do some dumb stuff. Uh, and I liked that. I thought that yeah. that worked well. She, I, I won't say redemption arc, but, you know, she has a redemption arc for me as a, as as a person i like flawed characters Mm -hmm. what i don't like is flawed characters that the text doesn't understand are flawed (laughs) and by the end i understand um that she's supposed to be uh and i'm on i i liked her much more in the last episodes i'll just say that i i agree Mm -hmm. um having you know giving her the chance to talk to the uruk yep giving her a chance to talk to theo yep I don't think it's a mistake that th- those are the two best characters in the show. Yes. Uh, and that those are the ones that bring her into focus yep. when she has a chance to talk to them. So, yeah. Uh, good job on Galadriel in the last episodes. 
Yeah. Um, I'm I'm on board. Hooray! Um, I I understand her character. There is nuance to it, and um, I think she can be our through line through all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, normally you want that to be somebody that we like more because I don't <laughs> like her, but I like her as a character. Yes, right. Which is an important. Yeah, very important distinction. So, yeah. um, okay, so let's talk about Numenor then. Yep. And here's my first question: mm-hmm. uh, When you know the queen and uh, everybody, Ellen Deal, they mm-hmm. f- return to Numenor. Uh, they kind of go through the little gate and they come mm-hmm. into that harbor, and they're looking at it in e- either shock or awe mm-hmm. because something is going down, and I have no idea what it was. What were we supposed oh, to get from they, that? Oh, there's one line earlier that they said we'll have to hang the black flags because the um because when the father dies, so black flags oh, being hung from the was? masts means that the father has died oh, and man. she is now queen. I missed that. Yeah, it was one easy line to miss, mm. and was when they first panned across them, I'm like. Wait, what? Oh, right. They threw a, a, a throwaway oh, okay. line earlier. The throwaway line. Like, okay. the, the so, steward guys, like, prepare the black flags yeah. or whatever. So. so so what's up with uh, with that king? Uh, what was the whole business at the end? He wanted to... Oh, he shows... He's been using Isildur's a palantir. sister's palantir. Yes. And the palantir lets him see the future, and now it's driven him crazy or something. Yeah. Well, I don't get palantirs. Um, like... I had always thought, and I just could be totally wrong on this, that in, uh, in, like, what's up with them? Are, were they always evil things? They were not. And that's right. why that was, that felt like a weird yeah. reveal to me at the end, uh, because they are not inherently evil. Sauron very overtly corrupted the two that are in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Right. Uh, but there's, Others that exist. Uh, there's mm-hmm. one in the Grey Havens, for example, right. uh, that has been kind of damaged. It can mm-hmm. only look to the west. Okay. Uh, it can only look out towards, you know, heaven or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can't be repurposed. It can't point anywhere else. And so it's not evil, but it's mm-hmm. broken. By the time we get to Lord of the Rings, they're all broken. Okay. But at this point in history... I feel like this is just another one of those we need to hit all the greatest hits. So yeah. we have to have palantirs. And since we have to have palantirs, then we have to have them be ominous. Um, I, I don't know what's going on with him. I don't know what's going on with all of Numenor. Uh, let me talk about one my narratively one of my biggest problems with the show is that okay. Numenor decides three different times to go to fight the evil in Mordor. Yeah. So we have, uh, like, so we have the end of episode four, which we talked about before, Mm -hmm. where the queen's like, we will sail to Numenor. And everyone, like, cheers, right? Yeah. We go to episode five, and I thought I'd missed something because I'm watching episode five. I'm like, they're doing the same plot again, right? Now they're questioning. They don't have the boats yet. Like, they should have just started sailing in that episode. We don't need another episode about... And it's like, you have a limited amount of time. Uh, It doesn't feel terribly rushed like Wheel of Time did. Mm -hmm. So there is that to them. So they can linger. But you spend this whole episode coming to the same conclusion we did before. And then you still, at the end of the series, have to come to that same conclusion. Now, I'm okay with that one more because we've suffered a great failure. Do we keep to our principles? that's worth having a conversation about. But why do we have two episodes that end with the exact same... Um... I, I think they were trying to do tri-fail cycles. Okay. And I think they were trying to make Galadriel earn her thing. Because her okay. whole thing, her whole deal is, Sauron's still out there. We need to raise a huge army and go mm-hmm. beat him up. And when she shows up in Numenor, mm-hmm. that is you know the only drum she beats over yep. and over again. And I think... That if at the end of four, we'd already seen them sailing, that it would have looked even more of a... But why then have at the end of four them say, yes, we're going to do that? Have the queen, like she gave a speech about how we're going to do it, right? I don't know. You're right. Mm -hmm. I think that they should have started sailing in four, and then that would have given them an extra episode to do investigation in the Southlands and Mm -hmm. find the village they're supposed to do, uh, because that part was weirdly rushed. Yes, that is the most Um, weirdly rushed part They spent. 
too much time in Numenor making the same decision over and over again, and then not enough time actually in And then Earth. they ride to one battle, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what's his name? Loses his son, uh, who's totally dead. Totally super dead. Super dead. Isildur, we know he's never coming he's back. He's never coming back. Um, um, and loses his son. And, like, what did he think would happen when you bring your son to war? Right? Like, well, I understand feeling pain and stuff. He didn't want to bring him to war, did he? He did, but he didn't think he was worthy of it. They have oh, a warrior's okay. culture, an honor culture, That's right? right? Mm -hmm. That's how they're all about. You got kicked out. You can't come to war because you're not worth it. You don't. Get to be you here. don't get to be have a chance of being killed. Yeah. Um, and I'm okay with the father, let me make it clear, grieving mm -hmm. over the loss of his son. But yeah. this did it, you you if you're gonna build a warrior honor culture sort of thing, and then you go to war with your son, and then your son doesn't come back because he was saving the queen's life. You saying this was all a mistake, that elf, I'm back like he has a complete reversal of character, which I understand yeah. you could do this, but it is not presented like you you lose a battle. Okay, I understand, but yeah, either your quest was right or it was wrong. Well, see, and the story beat there yes. feels like it should have been, we thought we were going to beat up some orcs. We mm -hmm. didn't expect Mordor to be created yes. ex nihilo. Mm -hmm. And now we're in like a wasteland. Yes. And that is absolutely a you know what, let's go back home and regroup and, and yes. come up with a better plan. Uh, and it might have just been an attempt to insert some personal drama into that tactical decision that made it about the sun instead of about Yes, Earth totally could, could see you doing that effectively. I don't feel like they did. Yeah, but no, I agree with you. Uh, I will say the queen saying, no, no, no. She she voices my concerns, and I'll the people who are going to type comments about it. You can you can stop typing. I recognize the queen has the same concern. She says to him, basically, look, this was the right thing. Us failing doesn't mean it wasn't right mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. In fact, I'm convinced it's more right now because Morador has been created, and that's a big, yeah. scary, dangerous this is thing. Bad news. Um. Bears. So good on them for having that kind of button put on the end of it. Mm -hmm. But I just don't get the whole Numenor thing, right? It's like, if you're going to go have them be... So there's so many different ways you could do this plot. They are so overconfident. They're like, oh yeah, we're the best fighters in the world. Of course we can go take out... What? Oh, mm -hmm. there's some little bands of orcs. Whatever. All right, we're going to send a big campaign and show how awesome we are. You're going to be in our debt, right? Yeah. That could totally have been... A thing. If that's the case, why do you spend like three episodes, torturously slow and boring episodes for me, having them come to the decision that they're going to go do this? Why do you have the scenes of Gladriel showing, you know, how bad of fighters they are um, that could totally fit into the archetype that I'm looking at here, but mm -hmm. it doesn't slot into the way that they're doing it. They're all kind of uncertain. Am I going to prove myself or things like that? And then they get defeated what is this narrative saying? It's not saying anything. It's not. They don't have a character arc as a culture. They don't, aren't, like, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't build toward yes. anything. That's what I mean uh, by that. I, yeah, I, I, right. I am really glad mm -hmm. that they didn't sink Numenor into the sea as part of season one. They did mm -hmm. at least hold one arrow in their quiver for season two. Oh, they also right? held Forging the One Ring. Let's point that out. Uh, yes. yes. Mm hmm. But yes. Though, though, like I said, I thought that it already happened because I mm -hmm. wasn't paying attention, apparently. Um, I, you, one thing that I am pretty certain of mm -hmm. is they spent two or three conversations, which isn't a ton over the course yes. of eight episodes, but they really hit hard. This is a really special horse. Yes. These are specially bred wonder horses. And then it goes missing. Yes. And that's where Shadowfax eventually comes from, because Gandalf talks all about the amazing super horses that they that have. The lineage of kings of horses. Yeah. Oh no! Like I didn't. The put origin that story of everything is I in didn't season put one. Together, I put together. They have oh, they have cool horses in Middle they Earth. They have cool horses, right? And oh, the horse is going back for Isildur. He knows he's not dead. Dad, you're the one that told him that there's a bond between the horse and the man. Maybe the horse knows something you don't. Oh, you're suddenly stupid because you, like yeah. everyone else, 
didn't actually do anything that a military should do in the situation they're in. Mm-hmm. There's no triage. There's no, uh, you know, that's yeah. like that's build a base and see if, where the wounded and, and survivors and that are. One hurt. Let's more. scout the scene. Let's they like, they didn't do any of it. That one hurt more because like. I don't believe that Isildur is a great military mind. Yes. I don't believe that the queen is a great military mind, but I really liked Ellen Deal. I liked him. I wanted him to be good. And then he just was not great yeah. in the last couple episodes. Yeah, yeah. Like if Ellen Deal was like, no, no, I've been in war. Here's what we need to do. Triage over there. Yes, I know you're queen. I'm in charge now. I'm the the lowest of the elves, but we need we need a perimeter. We need to make sure the arcs don't attack us in the yeah. smoke. We need to f- search every one of these buildings, starting with the ones that are on fire for people who have been left behind. Mm-hmm. We need a tent here to stop the ash so that we can actually set up a base. Uh, and you know, no, none of it. We just are no. a sorry, sad lot that are wandering away. That there's no one attacking us, but for some reason we have to get back over we here. Get out of here right yeah. now! We've mm-hmm. already killed every orc yes. in the whole land, except for the ones that chased. It was what's so out of annoying the because there's a scene where Galadriel helps Theo because he's a main character. She mm-hmm. recognizes he has like an exclamation point as over his head. He's glowing. <laughs> She's like, "Oh, you're a main character." In that that same scene, it pans across someone groaning on the floor for help, and they just walk past it. Go watch it again. It is dreadful that the main character syndrome going on with this. Okay, but is that something they wrote into it, or was that like the Key and Peel sketch with the extra? Yeah. Who just every time the camera panned by was doing everything he could to draw focus i don't know they but like they couldn't get a good shot without that guy moaning galadriel couldn't look right there and help the person who's no yeah she's got to help the little kid are you okay you're a little kid and you're also got a you know you've got a main character badge yeah. um you're one of the pcs yeah so yep mm. there was a lot of dumb stuff going mm. on oh my word so you I gave it a six out of ten. That might be, um, that might be stretching. I have to honestly, to be perfectly honest, it is better than Wheel of Time. I'm sorry, Wheel of Time. There's yeah. uh, some things I love like about I, Wheel of Time. I, I wouldn't even wince when I said that. I yeah. think it is well, empirically I'm a, and obviously. Better. I'm a producer on Wheel of Time, and I know all this. I people. understand that. Uh, but let's point out, Wheel of Time got like you know an eight to $10 million budget. And this has a $60 million budget per episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I might've given a wheel of time a six out of 10. And I will have to demote it if I did, because this is, this is like the definition of like, it's better than average, par- mostly because of the visuals, mm-hmm. but with some good, really good moments, I still want to watch more of it, but it sure wasn't great for me. Yeah. Um, the narrative mistakes that Wheel mm-hmm. of Time made feel much more egregious to me. Yes, I would um, agree with that. Though they had a harder job, I think. They did. Smaller budget, um, and I would say and that... A much larger story. A book they had to adapt rather than we can basically do anything we want. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Uh, absolutely. They they had a much steeper hill to climb. Yes. Uh, they had a worse hand. They they didn't play it as well as I would have liked. Yep. Um. Ultimately, for me, Rings of Power is still a 7 or even an 8 out of 10. Because I loved loved it. An 8 out of 10. Yeah. Well, if your enjoyment of it is an 8 out of 10, you don't have to justify that. It it did dumb stuff Mm -hmm. left and right. But I've kind of been conditioned to expect that in my fantasy television. Okay. Okay. I mean, um, I'm the guy who put Speed Racer as a 10 out of 10, purely out of my the fact that I just love it. <laughs> so I I have no uh, ground to stand on and challenging, but an eight? Come on. It probably doesn't deserve an eight. I'll give it a seven. Okay. Um, and yeah, I I wish that it was better than it is, but... Now let's point out for both, in the defense of both... Uh, Wheel of Time and Lord of the Rings. Season one of Next Generation, one of the greatest shows of all time, is probably like a four. 
Oh, worse than yeah. that. Season one is a three, yeah. and season three maybe is a four. I By mean, season, season two. Yeah, season okay. three is when it gets good. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. And I watched every episode of that first season, and I appreciate it for what it was. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. The, the, but, but, yep. With, with with Rings of Power, they also didn't have sixty million dollars per episode. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, you can see yes. every penny of that on the screen. You can. They used their money well mm-hmm. in terms of character and budget and location and, yes. and everything. I'm going to argue that some of their armor and stuff looks real bad. Uh, and I feel like it, when we're comparing against the old the, the movie, where everything felt so authentic, they could have stretched a little further on some of this. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if you remember the armor that Galadriel is wearing when they sailed, sailed the Grey Havens. Granted, it is ceremonial armor at that point, yeah. but it looked like it was cardboard that was spray painted. It it looked yeah. dumb. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I, I I have a problem with some of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the, the cinematographer on this is great. They know how to yes. s- frame a shot and set it up, and they knew how to use Morador's uh, creation really well. Just the, and, I'm and constantly getting good visuals yeah. that aren't just special effects, but they're cinematic language that says this is epic, and I like that. And, and there are occasional flashes of absolute brilliance in the directing, in yes. some of the performances. Oh, performances are all Now and then in the writing, mm-hmm. uh, like that... That conversation you talked about with uh, Halbrandt talking to the Uruk, yes, and asking, "Do you recognize yes. me?" A like legit that genius moment, hit yeah. out of the park. It was mm-hmm. so good, yeah. and so I have to give it credit. Plus, in the back of my head, Rings of Power is still just the the role playing game fan fiction, uh, and I guess because I'm thinking of it in those terms, I'm willing to accept a lot of foolishness. Uh, all I will say is this: um, Give me sixty million dollars per episode, and uh, I will at least deliver a show that does not make major narrative blunders. Mm-hmm. Uh, and see, now I'm going to go and make my own show, and it's going to—I'm going to yeah. make all these same mistakes. But you know, <laughs> I feel like I feel like they—I don't know. Uh, I feel like. What I know of the of the industry, this is probably not the fault of the people who are actually making oh, the show. Yeah. And I understand that you're if anyone happened to be watching this, I doubt they will be, but they'll and they're, they're thinking, yeah, we wanted to do that. Yeah, we wanted to do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. we wanted to do that. Yeah. I feel your pain. We we have both worked in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. We both know exactly how really good decisions end up looking really dumb on screen. Really good decisions. I'm putting that good in quotes. <laughs> really good. Yeah. Good intentions. Yeah. But yeah. Um and we're we're basically out of time. But let me yeah. tell you, mm-hmm. uh if you are if you haven't ever worked in Hollywood, uh go watch a movie called The TV Set. Have you seen that? I haven't. David Duchovny, Sigourney Weaver. Mm-hmm. Uh he is a writer who writes a TV show and then basically the movie is just one compromise after another as the studio system grinds it into absolute pablum garbage and it is unerringly accurate in what happens to good ideas when vast corporations get hold of them. Yeah, uh, another example of that that I'll end on is uh, an essay called Building the Bomb um, by Terry Rossio, I believe, which is about the making of one of his favorite books. Uh, he's one of the screenwriters on Pirates of the Caribbean mm. and uh, stuff, making a Robert Heinlein book into a movie and step-by-step step how it went wrong. Yeah. So, how's that been? Yeah.